Welcome to this Ash Wednesday worship. Today we begin the journey of Lent. We begin to prepare ourselves for the celebration of Easter by reflecting on and being reminded of our desperate need for God. We begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join with me as we confess our sins. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn washing us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. We pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hate nothing you have made and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and honest hearts so that truly repenting of our sins, we may receive from you, the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, we join together by professing our faith, and we do so using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our first reading today is from the Gospel of Mark, beginning in chapter 1, verse 4. 
John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. This is our gospel reading. Our sermon text for this Ash Wednesday is from Paul's letter to the Romans, beginning in chapter 6, verse 1. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves 
dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is our reading. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that on this Ash Wednesday, as we begin our Lenten journey, we thank you that we are able to gather in this unique online format or to hear your word proclaimed or to, to, to see you at work in this season. God, I, I pray that you equip us to hear your word faithfully. And Lord, as we continue our Lenten journey, that you will strengthen us through this message. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So I've, I've been at Hope for about 10 years, and if you've known me long enough, you know that when I first got here, tradition was not something I was a big fan of. And I was always one to buck tradition wherever, wherever I could. And I had a, a bit of a parable of my own that I always wanted to share with people when they asked me about traditions. And it's about a little girl and her mother cooking their family's famous oven roast. So they prepare it with all the seasoning, with the cloves of garlic, with the carrots. They get it all ready to go. And the mom, before she puts it in the oven, takes the carving knife and slices off the ends of the roast and puts it in the oven and the little girl about five or six curious says mom why did we slice the ends off the roast and her mom says you never really thought about it my mom taught me how to make this dish um, and that's what she did um, I, I mean I know it helps it tastes great so but I don't know exactly what it does but you know what we should do we should ask your grandma we should ask your grandma why we do this and so they uh, hop on FaceTime and they reach out to the grandma and they ask her, why did you cut the ends off the roast? And she says, well, I'll be honest with you, I don't exactly know why, because uh, that's, what, that's what your mother, or that's what my mother did when she made the roast when I was a little girl and she taught me how to make it. And it's just what we always did. Well, the great grandmother's still alive and they, they do the same thing. They call her on the phone, they reach out and say, hey, Nana, why, why do we cut the ends off the roast for our, our special roast? And, great-grandmother says, oh darling, <laughs> when I started making it, I didn't have a pan big enough to fit the whole roast in there. So I just cut the ends off to make it fit. A lot of our traditions have roots in just practicality. A lot of our traditions are things that we do because they are convenient, they, they remind us what is important, or they just make things work easier. And in the church, we have a lot of traditions like that. Uh, traditions of maybe when the altar guild changes the pyramids, or you know, the tradition of having pews in a sanctuary, when in all reality, they're no more sacred than chairs, they're just historically cheaper to make and can fit more people. We have lots of traditions like those. And those are the kind of traditions like the ends off the roast that have the root in sort of these practical needs, but at the end of the day, they're really just traditions. But then we have traditions that aren't so easy to just make flexible. We have traditions that have deep roots in the life of the church, traditions that really go back across the entire history of the church. And one of our traditions is Ash Wednesday, where we worship together and begin a journey towards Jesus' death on the cross and us celebrating his resurrection at Easter. And an important part of our Ash Wednesday services across the life of the church has been what we call the imposition of the ashes. When you come forward and we mark your forehead with the cross and we say those words, from dust you came to dust you shall return. And it's a tradition that has deep roots in Scripture as well. Tamar covers herself in ash out of repentance. David, King David, covers himself in ash when he is repentant and mourning the loss of his child and mourning his own sin. It is a tradition that marks outwardly our inward repentance as we are reminded that we still desperately need Jesus. It is a tradition that matters. And it's a tradition that we don't take lightly. And here we are in a year, a year and a half of new traditions where a pandemic has raged across the world and we've had to make really difficult decisions. And this year, because of everything that's going on, we're unable to do the imposition 
of the ashes. And it's a decision that we haven't taken lightly. It's hard. It's heartbreaking because sometimes those traditions, they mean so much. It is like ripping a part of yourself out to make it go away, even for a short while. But it's still just a tradition. It doesn't do anything. Yes, it reminds you. Yes, it's a chance for us to gather, but it's just a tradition. A deep and meaningful one, yes, but it is still just a tradition. There's another tradition that we have, one that you heard at the beginning of this service. One that you hear in our church at the beginning of every service. We make the sign of the cross, and we begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's a good tradition, isn't it? In fact, it's also a tradition that has deep roots in Scripture. It's a tradition that has deep roots in your life as a follower of Jesus. Because it's a tradition that, for us, marks the beginning of every service with a reminder of our baptisms. Right here we have a baptismal font. And in it, water. Very much like the water that was sprinkled over your head, or maybe you were dunked, or maybe, maybe it was poured over you, but the waters of your baptism. Now, the difference between the imposition of the ashes, a great tradition, a visible reminder, the difference between that and this is the ashes don't do anything themselves. But here, here we have something deeper than a tradition. We have what we call a sacrament. We have here God's promise commanded by him in something that you can taste, touch, feel. We have God's very grace given to you in the water. When you're baptized, like Paul says, don't you know that you actually die with Christ? You're not just reminded of a death that will come, but you yourself, your sins, they are drowned in the waters of baptism. You don't come out of baptism the same person you went in, whether you remember it or not. Whether you were an infant or a senior, you don't come out the same way because baptism actually does something. Baptism has power. We receive it in faith. Our faith clings to it. We are actually entered into God's kingdom. We go into our Lenten journey together, already carrying a mark with us, one that the ashes only serve as a visible reminder. We already carry with us the mark of baptism because in it you were sealed for Jesus Christ. Through your baptism, you belong to him, joined together in his new life, Yes, we have traditions, and yes, it is so hard when we have to let them go. But this, this Wednesday, today, I want you to know this. You have something so much deeper than ashes on your forehead. Because in and through your baptisms, you have died and have been raised again. You have new life in Jesus Christ because of his death and resurrection. Because of what he did you don't have to do anything. You were already saved, already preserved, already sealed. And it's with that attitude that we do repent and come back and say, I still need you, Jesus, daily. And we track with him through the entirety of this Lenten season as we see again that story of him going to the cross for you, dying for you and being raised from the dead so that you may have new life in and through him as you move through the waters of baptism. My prayer, my hope for you as you go into this season, as we start our journey together, is that you remember the mark that you have in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that you are baptized, you have been made new, you have been brought through the waters, and you are sealed. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you that you don't leave it up to us to do the works, Lord, that would bring us into a good relationship with you, but that you reach into our lives 
you bring us your grace through your means, that you promise us through baptism we have something to trust, the promises of Jesus Christ, that we cling to it, the knowledge that no matter what, we are sealed for Christ because of his death and his resurrection. Lord, let that mark on our lives be the one that carries us through our everyday lives. Lord, let us proclaim that goodness to our friends, our families, and our neighbors throughout this season. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We pray. Merciful and gracious God, as we begin the season of Lent, I pray that you would strengthen us in the knowledge of our desperate need for you. Lord, strengthen us also in the good news that Jesus Christ is your response to that need. That he came to bring forgiveness. As we walk these 40 days of the season of Lent, Lord, prepare us for the good news of Easter, that it would ring profoundly in our hearts. That good news that in Jesus Christ and Him alone brings about our salvation through the cross. Lord, I pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go today with the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Depart in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>